There we go. For everyone joining, we'd love to know where you're joining from. You can pop that in the chat. On this beautiful, warm, warm day, most of us are in the air conditioning, but Wendy, I see you're outside. <laughs> beautiful. Craig Leith, Meaford, welcome everyone. Pretty River. Oh, I love the Pretty River Valley. We really do live in a spectacular part of the world. Another question for you, if you want to let us know which sector you are joining us from, whether it be business, nonprofit, government, or philanthropy, love to get a feel for who is in the community today. Hey, sorry, I'm just wondering, how do you do the chat? No problem. There should be, uh, Jasmine, a little um, icon at the bottom that looks like a little um, a speech bubble. It's been a long time. I haven't done Zoom for a long time where I've had to do chat. Let me just see here. No problem. Have, where there's, there I'm might be a on, more I'm on, button. A, I'm on a mobile, so it's a bit different. I know the interface. It's just, yeah. let's see here. Oh, okay. If I click on that, chat. Oh, I get it. Okay. Awesome. Okay, thanks. I, I get it. Awesome, thanks. Member of a co-op, counselors, welcome everyone. We're gonna keep admitting. And Roz, you let me know when you'd like me to. Well, the numbers keep growing, oh. Jess. We've got about yeah. 40 people in the room with lots more uh, coming in. Fabulous. It's great to see everyone. Mm -hmm. So just asked earlier, if you just joined us to um, please uh, tell us where you're coming from today and what uh, sector you're involved with. Are you involved in business or nonprofit or philanthropic or government? Great, looks like we've got lots of representation across all four sectors, which is exciting. If you haven't let us know yet where you're tuning in from, please do that as well. And Jess, I think uh, we can uh, get started. I've just let in um, Keith Hull, Mayor Perfect. of Collingwood. And uh, we've got a few other people in the waiting room that I'm letting in now, so why don't we begin? Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Jess Flynn. I was brought on by Roz and the Institute to help facilitate these very, very important meetings. Um, this is part two in the sustainable um, Economies of Sustainable Communities series, and it's all about affordable housing. And we are looking to some really powerful data to drive effective decision making. Uh, so the goal of these events are to bring residents, businesses, government, nonprofit, and philanthropic leaders together to discuss what each of us can do to help. This community conversation for the Great Simcoe region is a chance to hear what the numbers tell us about finding home in our communities in the midst of a housing crisis. The goal of this event is to bring us all together in those four sectors to discuss how each of us can help. 
Um, our speakers today are going to be sharing their data perspective from two recently published reports with lots of great information. These reports illustrate the magnitude of this community challenge and how it affects all of us. Through this knowledge sharing, we are better positioned to move toward solution making where each of us can play a role, each of us in this room and in the wider community. So the goals of what are being shared today, we're going to introduce you to these reports, to this data and that perspective on the current housing crisis. We're going to review key points in that data that will spark cross community participation. And we'll weave the idea of sustainable communities and housing affordability for all into this community conversation. Uh, before I go any further, as we're talking about uh, the great land that we all reside in, we do want to take a moment and review our land acknowledgement for this beautiful region. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we were on the lands that we have been occupied for over 8,000 years. We are gathered on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek Nation, the Patoon, and later the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, and the members of the Three Fires Confederacy, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe. The Huron, Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee Nations have also walked this territory over time. These First Peoples are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. This land is also home to many other diverse nations, Inuit and Métis people, both past and present. We are grateful for the opportunity to share in the riches of Southern Georgian Bay and its neighboring territories and to steward this land together. So we are hoping that today you are engaged participants uh, and are a part of this learning and uh, hope to plan on continuing participating in the solution to this issue. We're going to introduce the idea of community engagement and seeking and financing some of these critical social solutions. And please use the chat to discuss and we'll try and come up with some solutions today in the housing crisis um, for future publications similar to the ones that we're looking at today. So it's a very busy uh, group today. It's so good to see so many people on the call. Roz and I will be working together in the chat. We are going to try and address everyone's questions and concerns after our speakers uh, present the data to us. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I will pass it on to, to Yvonne. Oh, thank you very much, Jess. I'm Yvonne Hamlin. Uh, there's a deck there that you have, Jess, I think. Um, yeah. I'm going to start for those who are new uh, to this series, just tell you a bit about the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay. Uh, and as the uh, front page states, we're volunteer driven, always looking for help, not for profit, think and do tank. And next slide. So this map shows the six municipalities that the Institute uh, calls generally the area of Southern Georgian Bay, Collingwood, Wasaga Beach, Clearview, Town of Blue Mountains, Gray Highlands, and Meaford. Uh, next slide. The Institute has a vision. It has four parts to it. Uh, number one, harnessing the power of people in place. Where? In Southern Georgian Bay. Why? To grow social, environmental, and economic prosperity. And lastly, to be the smartest, greenest, healthiest, and most caring region in Ontario. Next slide. The Institute believes in collaboration. That would be the biggest takeaway I think you could take from uh, this particular slide. Collaboration among residents, businesses, local government, nonprofits and philanthropic organizations in Southern Georgian Bay. And these are our priority areas, arts and culture, business and innovation, social justice, health and well-being, and the environment. Next uh, slide. You're gonna be surprised to see what our 2022 work plan is. It got me tired just reading it when I was preparing for this. <laughs> so we're, we're and, and uh, what, what it's based on. So first I'm gonna tell you about what it's based on. This uh, series, online series started in 2020. Uh, 
with the mapping our road to recovery series, not surprisingly coming out of COVID and everyone sitting at home going, what next? Um, and we followed that with participation in the 2020 and 2021 UN Habitat and Towns uh, workshops in Toronto called the Calling World World Summits. And we have since that time uh, focused on four resolution items, including affordable housing, environmental challenges, connecting innovative towns and districts, and related pilot projects. In 2021, the series was called Our Sustainable Future. Uh, and in late 21 and into 22, we've had a group working on social finance and housing. They meet all the time <laughs> and they are participating also, and I'll tell you a bit more about this in a minute, the National Housing Lab uh, with Social Innovation Canada and CMHC. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the 2022 programming I was telling you about. So right now we're uh, in our local sustainable economy series. And the first one we featured the CAOs in Southern Georgian Bay who talked about sustainable communities. Uh, we're also this uh, year focusing on mapping out and showcasing our social enterprises in the region, conducting a feasibility study for our green economy hub, partnering on the expansion of the carbon foot footprint challenge, supporting a regional forum for artists and arts organization, and participating in the National Housing Lab, showcasing municipal leaders to accelerate progress on affordable housing, uh, and partnering on, partnering on pilot projects coming out of the UN Habitat and Towns Calling World, World Summits. Um, and we'll also be getting into community indicators to track progress. Uh, next slide, please. So as I'm sure everyone knows, in 2015, the UN member states shared a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and planet. At its heart are 17 sustainable development goals, uh, which are urgent calls for action by all countries. So we're focused, uh, you know, very much so on number 11, goals to make cities and towns inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And that's the end of the introduction. Oh, I think the next one we want, we do have some wonderful partners who've contributed to our series uh, and you can read through them here, several municipalities, consultants uh, and so on. I now have the pleasure of introducing uh, this, today's proceedings. Uh, and I have a short introduction. Uh, there are no slides but I'll just talk for a few minutes if I, if I may. Uh, if you're here today listening, you know that we have a housing crisis in our rural region, just like the big cities do. You will also learn, uh, so we're going to today explore the data that gives us glimpses into our reality. We're also gonna learn that this housing problem, it belongs to all of us. And we're going to, by the end of today's discussion, we're gonna have a greater understanding of some of those terms we all hear and, and, and wonder, what exactly does that mean? Affordable housing, attainable housing, subsidized housing, social housing, and understand why the planning for affordable housing should be on the agenda of every municipality, business, nonprofit, or philanthropic organization in our region. We're not, we, we really comprise many rural communities and our economies are based on tourism, farming and retirement services. That means traditionally we have lower waged employees in the service industries. And I'm talking about restaurants, hospitality, retail, farm labor, healthcare. And these are the people we're finding are unable to afford housing, even with the capacity to pay reasonable rents or having some down payment savings. So you're gonna hear about our current lack of our community's abilities to house people working in these sectors on minimum or even a living wage. And this lack of affordability affects seniors in all income levels as well. During the last two years, the Institute's online discussion series examined what it would take for our communities to be resilient and sustainable in the face of the pandemic. In these earlier series, we learned three truths. 
One, the municipality's abilities to work together to achieve scale across our region is critical. Two, each of our four sectors, and I'm talking business, government, nonprofit, philanthropic, hold different parts to the solution to a complex problem like the housing crisis. And three, no single actor, level of government or business sector can solve it on their own. You may have noticed that out of the pandemic, uh, municipalities have stepped up in their own ways. In Owen Sound, we have OSHARE that has served more than a thousand meals since the beginning of the pandemic. In Meaford, the Chamber of Commerce did a survey and it clearly pointed to business concerns. Without affordable housing, how will they ever be able to grow post pandemic? In the Blue Mountains right now, that community is challenging through tribunals and the courts, I'm sure. We'll wait to see where that goes. What about the province's requirements to require every municipality to provide affordable housing? How can they do that in new developments? Will the tribunals make that happen? And in Collingwood, where I'm sitting, we've had a citizen-led affordable housing task force that identified the need for increases in long-term rental housing. We have a study done, we have data, and this group continues to work with council uh, to help accelerate progress. Lastly, I'll just say, and echoing some words that Jess gave us, there's a part for every one of us to play. There, these are the expressions of traditions of rural care and collaboration for the good of the community. And this is the challenge that's up for discussion today. I hope you enjoy yourself. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Uh, you summarized uh, a lot of the work that our um, committees, various design teams, and, and certainly the social finance and uh, housing group uh, has been working on. And, uh, and many parts of the uh, challenge have been put together by uh, one of our fearless leaders, Marilyn Struthers, who is helping uh, guide us through this process. Um, good afternoon, I'm Rosalind Morrison, I'm Chair of the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay, and again, thank you to Jess uh, and Yvonne for helping out with this particular event, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speakers for today. Stuart Reed is going to be first up, and Stuart is the Executive Director of the Community Foundation, Gray Bruce. He has over 30 years of experience in the nonprofit sector and one of the great highlights um, as being uh, his leadership as director curator of the Tom Thompson Art Gallery in Owen Sound. Stuart and Christine McGregor, community outreach officer at the Community Foundation, were contributing writers of the Vital Focus on Housing Report, which is one of the many uh, vital signs reports that the Community Foundation has produced. After Stuart, we will hear from Mark Shevin Eady, who also has 30 years of experience, but in totally other area as a realtor in Southern Georgian Bay. Her well-informed insights and experience in housing, as well as community planning systems, has made her a natural leader in her roles as vice chair of the Collingwood Affordable Housing Task Force, as well as chair of the regional Affordable Housing Task Force, South Georgian Bay. Marg is best known as a passionate advocate of housing for all. Interesting that these two reports that we'll hear highlights from today have had so much community involvement from so many committee members in various sectors. And that's how the future is gonna unfold uh, as we work together in collaboration. So now Stuart, I think you're up first, over to you. Thank you, Ross. And uh, my colleague, uh, Christine McGregor, is going to help me out and run the slides uh, this afternoon. And uh, I'm going to be uh, presenting, telling you a little bit about Vital Signs, which is the mechanism we've used to uh, uh, pull together this report. And um, since 2016, Community Foundation Gray Bruce has been engaged with Vital Signs work. Um, our local foundation is part of a national network of uh, community foundations right across the country. Now we number over 200 from coast to coast to coast. Um, and uh, community foundations um, 
of Canada estimate that uh, over 90% of Canadians are served by a community foundation. And collectively, our network manages more than $6.2 billion in assets. So we're very much engaged in um, supporting community well-being. And uh, to grant strategically from our endowed assets, we rely on vital signs to provide local knowledge so that we can direct local impact. Um, so uh, vital signs itself is a community checkup that measures vitality, identifies significant trends, <clears throat> and supports action on issues that are critical to our quality of life, including housing as we see today. So in 2016, on the left, that's the cover of our first vital signs report, which was a full um, reckoning with data that addressed um, quite a roster of indicators of community well-being. You can see on the cover, health and wellness, arts and culture, education and lifelong learning, living standards, the environment and community connections. We followed that up with a shorter, uh, more appointed vital focus on youth in 2018. And um, youth um, dug into issue clusters that they identified as important to them. And uh, things like um, you know, transportation, having a voice in the community, the lack of youth spaces, health and wellness, substance use, economic barriers that were perceived as well as identity, identity and belonging. So both of these have informed our work as a foundation um, since their publication, and they continue to be great reference points for uh, people doing a deeper dig into how we're doing in Gray Bruce. And these are all available on our website for download. So um, housing, um, our vital focus on housing report aims to prompt conversation and broader awareness around issues that our community faces. This report draws from various sources and translates data into readable and accessible infographics to tell a story about how we're doing on the topic. We highlight stories of innovation and resilience through features on community projects that directly address um, impacts of the housing crisis. And um, we also set out in our opening statement, the foundation acknowledges that data and the way it's gathered relies on averages and summaries and the very nature of the system may not encompass all people equally. So um, data is collected, but you know you have to have an address and a home to participate in surveys and census. And what we do is we're acknowledging that not everyone has equal access to participate in that data. As well, we're a smaller population center, so it's di more difficult to reflect diverse perspectives in there. So we've tried to integrate um, voices with lived experience into the report by highlighting the projects that local um, organizations are engaged with. Also, um, we set out that access to safe and affordable housing um, impacts our local economy. Um, we asked the question, can people live near their place of work? Um, the security of having a stable and safe home is directly linked to every homeowner and renter's sense of belonging and well-being. If people spend too much on housing, their financial health is compromised and perhaps Access to other essentials like healthy food is diminished. Access to housing is a basic right, equally accessible to all ages, genders, ethnicities, and incomes. How are Indigenous peoples' housing needs met? We try and address that in the report too. In Gray and Bruce counties, we have uh, been impacted tremendously by demographic shifts and the volatile housing market. And this report notes the changes that we are seeing um, that are affecting our communities and their livability. So in the storytelling that is part of this report, we really wanna give context to the data and to give the reader some perspective um, also about some of the most vulnerable people in our community and the impacts that they are experiencing. So what have we learned? This slide asks, and there are some high level takeaways from the report and we, we cite those right off, the, right off the go at the beginning of the report. Both Gray and Bruce counties are desired locations for migrants from the GTA, we know that. And our area continues to grow in popularity is a great place to live, which means that housing prices are climbing higher and higher. We've also heard time and time again that the housing crisis is not just a problem of people who are economically challenged and working people who traditionally could be thought of as middle class are experiencing lack of housing options as well. As we explored housing solutions, we found that supports for the homeless or housing challenged are inadequate. And we must continue to work to ensure that supports are available in our community for those that are our most vulnerable. We want to leave, we want to leave no one behind. And, and the Institute's working group talked about housing for all as a, as a mantra. 
So we have been able to see that not everyone has the same access to affordable housing. And so we continue to work to ensure that everyone in our community has, has a roof over their heads. Our discussion about local housing began on December 9th, 2021, when we um, held a vital conversation on housing. This was a two hour meeting, over 85 people participated in online gathering during the pandemic. Um, and the conversation highlighted the importance of community, um, discussing housing, it stressed the importance of um, developing relationships and bringing all voices to the table while tackling issues related to housing. We held breakout sessions that invited perspectives from everyone that was on the call. So we also had scribes in each of the breakout rooms that were transcribing what they heard from people. So we were able to hear anecdotally um, some of the impacts on people's lives, uh, how, what the housing crisis, how it was affecting them. And participants um, shared, for example, that the high monthly cost of housing has made paying monthly bills more difficult. And some residents of Grey Bruce have had to compromise their health and well being to ensure that they keep a roof over their head. In our vital signs report, we tried to utilize the outcomes from that vital conversation uh, by integrating um, those anecdotal responses as key messages in throughout the report. We also did features on the four speakers who um, led the conversation during that evening as well. So it was really, really fodder for how we built the report. And as Yvonne mentioned, the SDGs figure prominently as well. This is the first vital signs report where we've trotted out the 17 goals that Canada has ascribed to by 2030. And uh, this is something we want to keep framing. Um, the SDGs are a great way to link what we're doing locally with what needs to happen globally. And uh, there is no insignificant action. And um, addressing each of these and housing figures so prominently in many of these 17 goals, as you see when you move through through our report. So in our report, um, next slide, Christine, we um, have broken it down. We broke down what we had in terms of data into four clusters. And those are, as you can see on the screen, housing and housing affordability and availability, housing and equity, housing and living standards, and housing and well-being. And um, these are the, the frontest pages of each of those cluster sections. And the, the colored bar up the side, it, there's a word cloud that sort of addresses what those concepts mean to us in terms of the way we've gathered data. So I draw your attention to that um, as, you, as you look through the report. And you can see the, the SDGs populating each um, opening page. We try and make uh, note of which, how that cluster uh, pertains to the sustainable development goals. So as, each, as we explore each topic, um, we include key themes that were shared at Vital Conversation and also those um, spotlight speaker pieces as well. Um, we also shared um, foundation and action um, features under each cluster and those highlight uh, grants that were dispersed to local organizations from our foundation and um, they really highlight and celebrate innovative projects and on the ground things that are happening that address the issue cluster related to housing. So I think you'll enjoy reading through the, through the report and, and learning a little bit more about the, um, the diversity of uh, incredible organizations that work in our community. So we're beginning with affordability and availability. Um, we opened it up. We also draw attention to definitions that um, relate to housing. Um, under affordability and availability, just some quick stats here. Um, these uh, data points. Um, in 2021, the Realtors Association, Gray Bruce Owen Sound, report the comprehensive annual average price was $650,944. That may not sound so high, but that is a 35.2% increase from all of 2020. So a huge jump in value. Also in this cluster, we heard the growing cost of housing is making housing unaffordable in our area. And this increasing market price impacts various aspects of the housing market, particularly rental and availability of rental stock. Low housing stock means it's difficult to find housing quickly, which is problematic and dangerous for those that are that urgently need a safe place to live. So people that are in housing precarity are impacted most tremendously by the inavailability and the price points of that are that are out in the marketplace. Then we move along to equity. And again, you can look up the, the sidebar just to see what the cluster is talking about, the ethnicity, about sexual orientation, 
gender divide? Do does everyone have access equally to um, what's what's out there? And we heard some um, hard hitting things too. Two one one, the United Way's um, call in line received seven hundred six calls from Gray County and two hundred eighty four calls from Bruce County that identified housing as the main need in twenty twenty one. We also heard that the data that we've collected shows that inequity does not contribute to a healthy community. That sounds pretty obvious. Um, Affordable housing units are experiencing opposition because of NIMBYism, not in my backyard. And solutions such as multifamily homes and in infilling are often opposed by um, municipal zoning laws as well. So um, then we move on to living standards and here running up. So this is about um, income. It's about work, work proximity to work, about how people are living together. Um, and uh, in this section, we hear that um, we outline statistics that like this one from the United Way of Bruce Gray, um, what talked about in um, March, 2022, so that's very recently, to afford a market rent of $1,500 a month for a one bedroom rental, a household must earn $60,000 a year or $32.96 per hour with a 35 hour work week. So that extrapolation of uh, market price and, and $1,500 a month for an apartment is a pretty darn good deal as we're beginning to learn. So that that is uh, really uh, kind of frames the issue for us. Also, we heard, we write, um, the location of affordable housing is an important consideration for equal access. Affordable housing is typically not built near to services or stores, and this limits the housing options available to those without reliable transportation. Vehicle ownership is a requirement for rural living. So um, the lack of a regional transportation system, um, even if people can find housing, this might put them at a disadvantage in terms of accessing the services they require or even working close to where they, where they live. And the final cluster um, talked about well-being and the, the word cloud there, mental well-being, inclusive communities. We also talk about the health and safety of the housing stock that is out there. Um, we, we report housing is an intersectional subject and we want to ensure that housing is being developed to encourage inclusive communities so that people are being accepted by their neighbors. And uh, we also report those residents of Grey Bruce who, who report below average well-being are generally women who are under the age of 35 who are living on their own. Um, we also report in this section about the recent homelessness enumeration in Grey Bruce County which um, reports some very um, um, amazing statistics. 142 households in Gray County and 77 households in Bruce County indicate they're experiencing homelessness. And then the, uh, the enumeration also um, gives light to the interrelationship of uh, housing precarity with other social um, um, uh, conditions such as mental illness or having a physical limitation, having a learning or cognitive limitation a mental health concern, or even a substance use concern. Um, those percentages figure for prominently in how, uh, with people that have reported uh, housing precarity. So um, our report, uh, I think there is optimism. Um, communities are resilient, um, embracing uh, diversity and inclusion. We move into a fertile plane where new ideas of how to live together in cooperation, emerge and flourish, partnerships, are cited as the real solution how, and we said that right off the top of this meeting, how new new relationships between philanthropy and government and or uh, not-for-profit organizations and, and municipalities, they have to be forged to really address the complexity of the issues that we're facing. And um, I refer you to our website. I hope that this uh, gives you, whets your appetite and you wanna learn more. Um, the report's available for download. And as well as our report, um, below it, you'll see that data source document button. Um, that is a, is a link to the uh, source document uh, that provides you a path to the actual data that we use to uh, put the report together. So if you really wanna go into deep dive learning, you can, you can follow through on that data source document to go to the source reports, which will give you an even broader perspective on the uh, crisis we're collectively facing but thank you for your attention today. And thank you, Christine, for running the slides.
Thank you so much, Stuart. That was a great presentation. Um, you know, vital signs reports are helping to build community knowledge right across the country and around the world. And your report has been written so beautifully. The way that you've got the data clusters, the way that you're telling the, the insights from the speakers, from the big community conversation last December, your optimism in, in spreading the stories about the various projects that are happening. Um, everyone who is on this call, um, I encourage you to read this document and as more and more municipalities start thinking about how do we build our own capacity for collecting data and analyzing it so that we understand these things, that uh, link that you've got at the bottom of the report is gonna be so important for so many people. Um, you're getting some kudos in the chat. Um, I just wanted to echo your clarity on definitions and how your report speaks to um, surprising groups that are struggling, like uh, women who live on their own um, under the age of 35 are one of the groups that are struggling to find affordable housing. And what does affordable housing mean again? It's 30% of your gross household income, pre-tax that means, um, that you're spending on housing, on shelter, so rental or ownership, if you're spending more than that, you do not have enough money for all the other things that are required in life. So we're not talking about um, social housing specifically, this affordable housing issue affects all segments of our population. So uh, thank you for um, a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, Marilyn, um, not Marilyn. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Ross. Okay, between Yvonne Stewart and yourself, you said everything that I was gonna say, so <laughs> I'm just gonna go grab a coffee, okay? <laughs> Bear with me here. You know we have to say things seven times in seven different ways, Mark. As you always <laughs> tell me. <laughs> So, I mean, the first thing I have to say is how grateful I am to be here and be part of this really important conversation with everyone and for everyone that has taken time out of their day to come and listen to us share a few thoughts. So <clears throat> I don't think it's news to anybody and you've heard it over and over that we have a housing crisis. We've become blind to the word home. And really, I think what's happened is we've become addicted to property speculation and growing our personal wealth through real estate. Housing has really become a competitive sport where only those with the highest incomes and the assets win. And that really isn't good news for our future sustainability as communities. So how did we get here? There's many, many reasons for it. Here's just a few. Single family zoning, which is roughly 70% of all properties in Canada, it only came to Canada in 1920. And since then, the world has changed dramatically. Today, we have less than half the number of people living in a house than we did back in 1920. Land back then was cheap and plentiful. In 1941, Canada had 2.2 million households, but today there are over 14 million. 30 to 40 years ago, in fact, 20 years ago, things like real estate investment trusts, short-term rentals, condominiums, house flipping, HGTV, all didn't exist. What we've seen is a really big growing gap, wealth gap and inequities in housing. We're not able to absorb the population growth that we have and the demographic changes unless we eliminate the forms of exclusionary zoning, like single family zoning, that block densification. We also know that the issue is really scary and complex. As has been mentioned, when people don't have housing that they can afford, regardless of income level, then there's not enough dollars left at the end of each month to eat well. There's not enough disposable dollars to shop local. We can't maintain or grow our labor force we start to lose our businesses. And all of this is already happening here. This really is a problem for everyone in the community and not just for those who lack adequate housing. It affects us all. Whoops. 
As part of the committee's research, we heard from over 400 people experiencing challenges in securing housing. And I wanna take a minute to honor those voices by just sharing a few of the hundreds of stories that we heard. So I'm gonna pause here for a minute or so so you can read these. And I know it's painful to read those, and those are all true stories. And as I say, there were many, many more. It affected me deeply uh, to read what people in our own community, our friends and neighbors are experiencing. So I just wanna go back to this discussion about what is affordable housing. And it's not what people think. The default position that many people have is that it's referring to social housing. And social housing is typically people in uh, under the 30th percentile of income. That is not affordable housing. It's part of affordable housing, but it's not the definition. As Roz said, it's when people are spending no more than 30% of the gross household income on shelters. So whether that's rent or mortgage payment, realty taxes and utilities. I'm gonna say it again affordable housing and social housing are two different things. It doesn't matter if you make 20,000 a year or 200,000 a year, it's still 30%. So this is what we say, housing for all, and we need complete communities for all people in order to be sustainable. When it comes to um, attainable housing, there is no universally accepted definition. In our area, we have different municipalities using that term with different definitions. It's quite funny, if you Google it, you'll see multiple different de uh, definitions. But I would say typically people are referring to workforce housing when they refer to attainable housing. So getting into some of the things that have happened. So one of the often overlooked areas of concern is the rate at which we are losing housing stock. A study that was done in Ottawa last year showed that they lost 15 affordable housing units for every one that they created. So while we don't have hard data here, if we look at South Georgian Bay, we know that we've lost untold numbers of affordable housing units to gentrification, vacancy decontrol, short-term rental accommodations, property sales, demolitions, rooming houses have been converted to boutique hotels, Tenants have been displaced when their homes have been sold, and we've seen demolition of affordable units in favor of upscale or supersized homes. And while this has been happening, how many affordable units have been created in our region? I would suggest that here, the ratio of units lost to those cre uh, created is far greater than 15 to 1. So it really starts with preserving the units that we have. While it won't solve the whole problem, municipalities do have tools uh, at their disposal, such as rental replacement bylaws to help tackle the challenge. According to the 2016 census, over 5,500 households in our area were in core housing need, meaning households that are living in unaffordable, inadequate or unsuitable housing. Now that was in 2016 when the median price of a home was less than half of what it costs today in South Georgian Bay. So what might that number be today after what we've seen happen in the real estate market? We do know that four times as many renter households are in core housing need compared to homeowners. Renters median gross household incomes are on average only 50% of those in homeowner families very often an, an overlooked statistic. So you can see on the screen there, in South Georgian Bay, median household income in 2016 was 62,671. Homeowners were 76,521, 
and renters were under $40,000. So when we're looking at uh, setting targets in a municipality for what we need, what we understand now is in order to have sustainable economies, the greatest need that we have is for rental housing. It should be understood that a middle income renter family can't be spending more than about $1,000 a month now on shelter costs. This is simply impossible in our area without some kind of significant change in policy direction and intervention. Did you know that to rent a one bedroom apartment now in South Georgian Bay would require an income of $37 an hour? The median rent for something larger would require an annual income of $120,000. In regard to ownership, only people in the top 10% of income in our area could afford to buy a house today. And the scary thing is we're seeing this decline in the real estate market that's happening actually has the effect of putting upward pressure on rental prices. A few other little things. In South Georgian Bay, 81% of people own their home and 19% rent. Interesting. With the average price of a home now over $1.1 million, how are we going to retain or grow our labor force? 65% of our labor force in this region uh, works in retail trade, healthcare, or food services, and many earn well below a living wage. In 2015, almost half of the renters in our region spent more than 30% of their income on shelter. Given what's happened and that rental rates have soared in the last couple of years, what might that number be today? People are struggling. We've heard from hospitals, police forces, engineering firms, and so many others. They're having great difficulties attracting workers due to the price of shelter. And without people working in those sectors, you can see how it would affect each and every one of us. No homes, no workers, no business. As was mentioned earlier, the solutions require all stakeholders to work together. Municipalities, other levels of government, developers, philanthropists, the business community and not-for-profit entities need to work together to find innovative solutions. For example, towns can encourage and seed the formation of not-for-profit entities that remove land from the speculative market and preserve them for the creation of affordable housing community land trusts, social financing, and nonprofit development are all happening around the country. While municipalities do have limited financial scope to deal with these issues and regulatory, they do have tools at their disposal. It starts with investing in appropriate data uh, and analysis to establish legitimate goals and targets that can be set and monitored. Land can be made available through housing first policies. Regulatory tools such as community improvement plans, rental replacement bylaws, capital facility bylaws can all be enacted. Single family zoning can be entirely eliminated in favor of allowing greater densities on each parcel of land. We can encourage underutilized buildings or land parcels to be used for affordable housing units and municipalities can be instrumental in paving the way for innovation. You know, 20 years ago, and I know this because I've been at this for a long time, nobody would talk about affordable housing, but today we really are seeing progress. The federal government in 2017 brought in a, a national housing strategy <clears throat> and started reinvesting in housing and innovation. The province engaged in affordable housing task force and has started adjusting policies around housing. In our region, municipalities are starting to recognize that affordable housing is a priority. Town of Blue Mountains led the way with forming the Attainable Housing Corporation, I believe in 2013. Collingwood has uh, an affordable housing task force and Meaford uh, and Wasaka Beach have recently passed motions to proceed in the same direction. Clearview has a motion on the table on Monday to form a committee. So work is being done to share knowledge and best practices regionally. And slowly, that needle is starting to move. 
So what can you do right now? You can ask your town to form an affordable housing committee. It's an election year, folks. <laughs> and then volunteer and support those efforts. Instead of being a NIMBY and saying, no, not in my backyard, be a YIMBY and say yes to housing for all. Look for emerging opportunities to volunteer and or invest in things like a community land trust, community bonds, or a not-for-profit housing corporation. Think about ways that businesses, churches, and other sectors you may be connected to can be part of the solution. And the important thing is let's start focusing on solutions and not just on the problems. We all need to work on this together. We have to find a way forward, and today is an opportunity for you to share what you feel should happen next. Thank you so much for listening. Mark, thank you so much for taking your 30 years of experience and working with your uh, regional task force on this superb report. And, um, and to be able to involve so many municipalities in um, learning together uh, through the deputations that you are making to the municipal councils across the region. Um, the, the number of uh, residents and citizens who have been involved in the various committees that you've been involved with uh, is a great sign of progress. And I love the fact that you uh, featured all the progress that was being made because we sometimes feel overwhelmed with such a complex and big issue like housing. Um, so we're all on this learning journey and you make it so easy for us to absorb uh, the key elements that we need to be thinking about. Um, some of the things that, that really popped out for me is the, um, the stories that you shared from the people who are experiencing difficulty finding a home. Um, at the, the, you know, understanding how did we get here over several decades and um, not forgetting our history and thinking about well, what policies were in place 30 or 40 years ago to help the situation post-war as an example and seeing some of those changes being made. Um, the core housing need number of 5,500 and change uh, from 2016 is, is probably, as you say, much higher. And so we need to be thinking about that uh, challenging issue of putting all the players at the table who actually make uh, rental housing happen. And, you know, in terms of next steps, how do we think about setting the table, if you will, to invite all those people, as you've invited everyone on this call, to think about what they can do? How do we put those groups together so that we can develop solutions together? So thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, Jess is going to be putting into the chat very soon um, what question would you like to ask our speakers, which she's popped in there now, about what the numbers tell us about housing in our community? Do you have specific questions, uh, everyone on this call, uh, about the numbers? We'll start there before we dive deeply into our collective solution discussion. Roz, have you, has everyone seen the links too to the reports and then a couple of questions about the numbers? Did those come into the chat? They did. Okay, perfect. I have a, a question while, while the chat's getting generated there about, you know, both Stuart and Mark spoke about volunteering on committees. Can you kind of give us a, a layout of what these committees work on and, and what, what happens with the work and, and with the data that's collected? Well, um, in terms of the affordable housing committees that we've been talking about in South Georgian Bay for each municipality, it's driving first of all and foremost uh, data collection an interpretation of that data because most municipalities don't really know what do they have and what do they need and how do you get there. And then it's taking a look at all the many, many tools that exist in a municipal toolkit and what municipalities can do and help guide and make recommendations to the individual councils as to how those things can fit within their municipalities 
And it sounds kind of scary for somebody that doesn't work in that space, but I can tell you, having done it with Collingwood, a number of people uh, on the committee had no experience in this area and now um, know lots of things because we all did learning together and arrived at amazing conclusions. So, you know, people really do need, I, I had the mayor of one municipality express to me that they were concerned about forming a committee because they didn't feel anybody would volunteer. I agree with Mark. I think that um, the uh, commodification of housing group that was meeting over um, the last number of months, uh, it's really been a gathering of people um, and uh, kind of pulling the, the, the strings together into a net and um, also looking outside our own circle for best practices from other communities across the country and around the world. The, the Collingwood Summit last fall, um, we heard um, really innovative uh, things in relation to housing and concepts of ownership and new ways of living that uh, can be inspirations for us here in, in uh, Canada and North America with the, with the issues we're tackling. And um, that kind of um, knowledge gathering is really is really key. Um, these these situations that we've described here in in our in Southern Georgian Bay and Great Bruce, I, those are not um, isolated here. And a lot of communities across the country are struggling. And and learning from our peers is really um, a great way to um, land on solutions that might be just right for us that could be tailored for us as well. Thanks, right. Stuart. Jess, I'm going to let you um, look at the chat and um, mm -hmm. and before we get to you with those questions that are now starting to roll in, uh, Jasmine, you have your hand up. What would you like to say? Try and figure this out. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm really interested in attending this meeting, first of all. Um, I'm someone that... Sorry. <laughs> is currently experiencing homelessness. And I know a lot of people that personally now in Owen Sound and uh, particularly who are in the situation. Well, we're very <laughs> I think happy. I'm so emotional. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a heartbreaking so I, situation. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to be so emotional. Uh, what yeah, would you like and uh, so, I'm sorry? What would you like to share today? Well, um, I've gone, I, I do have firsthand experience now over the last year and a half, actually, not being housed. And um, so I have a lot of information and stories and experiences um, firsthand. And I'm um, very passionate about the situation. And uh, one thing I just did two nights ago, um, I, uh, I went through the YMCA Owen Sound job board and having been someone who is, has an undergrad honors in music performance as a classically trained professional musician with the Montreal Symphony for over 20 years, owned a home in Montreal. I have two children, 16 and 20. I come from Terra, so it's just a little bit outside of Owen Sound, and had to return because as a single parent, um, who's the father of my children, did not pay child support. So I supported my kids on my own um, on a musician's salary. Now that was a very good salary in Montreal, the top that you can make in Canada, but still wasn't good enough. Um, had to return to the area with my children and immediately discovered it would be impossible to purchase a house on my own. And as the years have accumulated, I now find myself, it's absolutely impossible. It was already impossible to rent in 2017. I returned in 2017. Um, and so as a professional musician, I was working in still Montreal for several years while, it's, while I moved back here. My kids were enrolled then locally in school and I was still working. Um, in Montreal for two years consistently because that's where my work was. But I just, so, and then as, and I worked in the Toronto, in Toronto as the Canadian Opera Company, which I just finished a contract this spring. Uh, pandemic was very harsh uh, prefer, for preferring our li live artists. But besides that, um, with the pandemic and not being able to make a living doing what I did, 
living now locally fully, um, I was reduced to only minimum wage jobs, the only thing I could do. So I was working at Tim Hortons and Staples for the for about two years, year and a half. Uh, I would have to say that's impossible. I was renting my stayed in a motel for six months while working, paying and making arrangements financially to find a fee I could pay weekly for a room. There was no other options. Um, and also then I was reduced to a bedroom, which would be 600 bucks a month. And that back then was cheap. It's, it's come up even just for a bedroom. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, looking at the job board, I do think it's very important point is that here in own sound i'm just that there's 183 jobs there two days ago and the majority of them are all labor retail fast food yeah that's so, minimal wage and that's very hard so that's my little point sorry i, it, I have it's to, it's not a little I'm point what everyone has to say it's not a little point. It's um, a beautifully uh, told story. Um, and in particular, uh, showcases a very important sector in our communities, which are our artists and our art sector, and um, how much work we all have to do to uh, be able to understand what we need to do for artists um, uh, and to build a healthy... Yeah, and that's a long conversation too, but but we'll connect Absolutely. later, Jasmine. I am so grateful that you joined this conversation to share um, uh, you know, the reality of this situation that so many people are facing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Jess for a question um, and then um, Alara has his hand up. Jess, over to you. So the first question was from Joyce and Joyce, I believe you're asking about the report. So were the reports um, that our speakers uh, spoke to, did it break it down within the county by town, um, kind of where those biggest pockets of need are geographically, even within the region? I'm not sure who the, that question is directed to, Stuart or, or I, but the regional report on this end of South Georgian Bay, there is an appendix and it does break everything down by municipality. Great. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Over to you, Alar. Hi, um, everyone. I'm Alar Swever. I'm the mayor of the town of Blue Mountains, and uh, we're right in the middle of it right now. Um, actually, tomorrow at County Council, we finally got a report which uh, the county now says they have a lack of planning tools. Um, that's not our position, obviously. Um, we, we did go to the Ontario Land Tribunal. We, did get, we, we, we asked the developer to provide the 30%, which is suggested in the um, county official plan of affordable units. Um, Gets a little complicated after that because when you look at the provincial policy statement and stuff, there are really two housing markets here. The problem is much more acute in South Georgian Bay than the rest of Gray County. Um, numbers we generated, you know, and very similar to the um, Gray Bruce Foundation report, they referred to an average sales price of 645. Um, the impact data suggests it may be around 700, um, but in the Blue Mountains, it was 1.56 million. So, um, you know, and, and similarly, you know, in Collingwood, I forget the number, but it was over a million. So it, it gets very difficult um, to, you know, for anybody in this area to live. So the only way we can really work on this is to convince developers to, to work with us and you know we've got to apply some pressure through the planning tools that we believe are available and it's very interesting that since I resigned from the county affordable housing task force and not made the news I've had uh, four developers approach us so we have four meetings next in the next few weeks and they want to know how they can work with us to and what they can do now obviously you know there's financial constraints and we'll see where we end up but you know when you're building two million dollar homes i'm suggesting there's a bit of slack uh, that you can afford to make a little less money on a few homes and you don't have to make the huge profits that they're making on the two million dollar homes on every home 
And, you know, I think there are things that we can do as municipal governments to apply persuasion. I wouldn't say pressure, just persuade them. And I think as I, I tell developers, you know, as my, formerly my career was in mining and mining companies recognize that today you have a thing called the social license to operate. And, um, you know, that seems to be not well known in the development community that, um, you know, there is some social responsibility there. If you're coming to a community and making millions of dollars, um, you have to contribute to that the well-being of that community and the provincial policy statement and the planning act actually say that but planners often ignore that and say well no we don't have the tools and what we're saying is actually look at the planning act look at the provincial policy statement even the great county official plan and i'll be speaking to that so i don't want to take up too much time but if you want to watch county council tomorrow i'll be speaking to that there, there's a whole bunch of things in there. They even ask, what is the proposed sales price? And developers leave that blank. And planners tell me, well, we don't, they don't know. Yeah. Nobody starts a multi-million dollar project without knowing that they're going to make money. So I, I think you raise um, several uh, excellent points. Um, and I'm so glad that you joined uh, uh, the event today. And I hope that you'll think about joining um, Collingwood's um, workshop on June 30th and, and bring those four developers with you because um, we're all learning together. Um, yeah. And I think that every sector and every level of government we'll have to do something differently to break this log jam. So it's, it's, um, it's continuing the dialogue um, and uh, continuing to um, help with the knowledge sharing so that we all understand um, not only what, what people think we're supposed to be doing now, but also to say, okay, what could we be doing differently and how might that work? And let's take a little risk together. So thank you so much for joining us today, um, Alar. Really appreciate it. Well, Over to you, you, Jess. Thank you for having this. Mm -hmm. And on that topic of, of development and developers, we did have a comment from George Watson that the Blue Mountains had just lost a court case regarding trying to enforce a developer to build a percentage of affordable housing. Um, you now people do have property rights and if they do not want um, something in their, in their cooperative, in their building, they don't have, or something they do not want in their development, it becomes a legal issue. So maybe for our speakers, when it comes to developers, how do you see this becoming a more fluid, um, less of that log jam roadblock when it comes to uh, working with developers? So in my opinion, it is, it is extremely difficult for developers independently to be able to provide affordable housing. I mean, the cost of materials and labor and land is what it is. And, you know, there's no question about that. So, um, I mean, it's a big, big topic. It's not a little topic. There are ways to do it. It's being done successfully. It's being done right within Simcoe and Gray counties with developers who are doing it. Uh, they have some area of expertise, but often it involves combining market rate housing uh, and affordable housing. So I just read yesterday in Barrie, a development that's going up and 60% uh, of the units are luxury rentals and 40% are affordable and they're being combined. So um, that would be one example. There are many other examples, but as I say, it's too big a topic to do and developers need to work with municipalities and others to get there. Thanks, Mark. Uh, before we go to Megan Miles's question, Jess, um, just George Watson has his hand up and uh, he was the one that put that uh, point in. So uh, George, if, um, if you have a brief uh, response to that. Yeah, yeah, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the government themselves under their uh, More Homes, More Choices Act talked about the two main things that contribute to uh, skyrocketing prices is uh, NIMBYism was number one and duplication of, of services uh, through the planning process to do that. And that, But they did come up with one good idea and Wasaga Beach is perfectly positioned for that because 
Our largest landowner is the provincial government with crown land of 4,600 acres in Wasaga Beach. And they talked about freeing up some of this land because land is a huge component of, of uh, producing uh, affordable housing. So if the province can get their act together to do it, then that's going to really help the situation. And I know myself and our council is going to be pushing um, because of all the land in town to get that freed up to uh, embark on that journey to get some affordable housing through those means and, and the province has pointed out themselves. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thanks, George. Um, okay, Megan asks, do you have a best practice for a committee's terms of reference? How can municipal councillor empower them to make meaningful contributions? So I'm at, um, how can a councillor empower their committee to really make, make an impact when they do decide to join? Maybe Stuart, if you have any um, best practices for forming these committees when they're new to a municipality. Well, um, I don't really have any experience with, you know, terms of reference for that type of uh, committee, but, uh, you know, kind of building on the last point too, I think the community foundation's role about bringing people to the table to convene discussion around um, well-being and, and in this case around housing, you know, it's really important to, um, to integrate these um, vested stakeholders in the conversation. So bringing lived experience to the table, like the Jasmine shared today, and also uh, developers who are um, sometimes noticeably missing from the conversation. We have to find bridges to uh, br bring other voices together to really uh, make for meaningful solutions. Um, terms of reference, um, I, uh, I, again, I go back to best practices. I talk to talk to uh, other um, other municipal bodies that that can share share templates with you. Um, look for um, municipalities that are celebrating um, innovative solutions and see if they'll share. I think that that's a, a great way to uh, find find a, a, a template. Mark, it, uh, are Collingwood's um, t uh, terms of reference uh, on the website? I'm not sure if they're on their website or not, but I have them and I, I'm happy to email them out to anybody. The other thing that I would just offer is um, on behalf of the regional committee, I'm happy to meet with anybody, talk with anybody in any municipality uh, and help in helping uh, set up these committees and frames of reference. Uh, Mark, uh, did I hear you offer that you would be willing to put your email um, address into, uh, into the chat? It's in there, yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Um, I just wanted, uh, you know, I'm losing juice of course here, so I'm, I'm moving. But um, Stuart, I just wanted to point out um, a, a uh, data point that I couldn't um, not uh, bring to the attention of everyone, which is $6.2 billion in assets of community foundations across the country. So here's a great example of a sector who's going to do something differently. They're not going to keep that $6.2 billion in endowments um, in investments that you know are in the stock market or bond market. Stuart, in a nutshell, can you just tell us how they are doing things differently? Well, there's a lot of talk about um, just what you're describing, Roz, in terms of uh, social impact investing, about uh, ways of investing those community assets locally rather than putting them in the global marketplace and trying to do, you know, earn earn money so we're continuing to grant, but do good things with the dollars in a local framework. So um, impact investing can take many loans, um, can take many forms. It could be a loan to kickstart a, a new project in housing. Um, we've heard community bonds mentioned too. Um, philanthropic organizations are, are looking at that. There's also ways of pooling resources um, and leveraging um, capital that can uh, also aid in uh, getting projects off the ground, um, supporting um, innovation and knowledge building um, is something we do very actively as well. So um, our community foundation, Gray Bruce is, is actively learning about social impact investing ourselves. And again, I, I say we're looking to our peers and, and some of the um, innovation that's happened. Uh, if you, uh, our London Community Foundation is a great example. If you look at their website, um, there's some terrific um, stories about the ways that they've leveraged um, their community assets for um, good in relation to affordable housing, which they've made a, a big priority there. So I, I feel strong about uh, mentioning that 
that uh, collegial agency as an example. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, we have 15 minutes and 22 messages. So <laughs> we're going to be zooming through this. Um, so over to you, Jess, for one next question, and then Joe Belanger has his hand up. Sure. So from Nicholas, are there specific things municipalities need to do or policies municipalities need to put in place to support community land trusts and or community finance or other community-led solutions to this housing crisis. I imagine providing land to a land trust is one action as, as George touched on, but what else is needed? Maybe Mark, do you wanna take that one first? Sure, so although it can be done without a municipality, uh, municipalities are able to seed the formation. Let's talk, for example, a community land trust so there is a development process for setting that up. There's legal fees and recruiting uh, people to sit on a board of directors and establishing articles of incorporation and setting goals and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so municipalities can be effective in doing that. And also, as uh, Nicholas mentioned, potentially providing land uh, donation into a land trust. That land then is out of the, the speculative market forever. So that would certainly be one action. There's many more, but that's one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. And that really too, um, Mark touches on the next question, which is that that person asked, can we do it without a municipality? So you're saying technically yes, but it works a lot more efficiently when we work together with your municipality. Um, Deborah, uh, are there any developers on the call today? If so, as a policymaker, uh, she'd be very supportive of eliminating or drastically reducing single family zoning. Um, but if there is a developer, and maybe we'll hold, if there's a developer, think about this question because I forgot Joe has his hand up. Um, so if there's someone who could answer that, what kind of pushback would there be from those who do build and sell homes? on that change of the zoning. And then uh, Joe, we'll, we'll throw it over to you now. Thank you. Uh, my comments are a little around uh, workforce housing, which we're touching on. And uh, what I don't hear very often and what I've become aware of uh, from uh, situations that happened in Whistler some time ago uh, during the Olympics where they were having a crisis on workforce housing was they created restricted housing. And restricted housing, what's really good about that is it keeps it affordable over time. Like often we could do incentives or we could uh, discount land and, uh, and, and if those are affordable, but then become market driven after the fact, they can become unaffordable very quickly. Uh, what the restrictive housing does is that it uh, is a uh, negotiated contract with either uh, you know, a renter or an owner where uh, that uh, property can only evaluate uh, on a certain percentage a year so that it stays uh, very affordable over a very long time. And, and the only other point uh, to be made is that architectural design has so much to do with the acceptance of affordable housing into the greater, uh, you know, uh, subdivisions that uh, that already exist, and uh, again, Whistler was a great example where their restricted affordable housing uh, was beautiful. It, it looked like chalets. It blended in perfectly. So we tend to often, uh, with affordable housing, make it look affordable, and uh, and really, there's ways through architectural design to make it. Uh, fit into subdivisions very well. Thanks, Joe. I'm just going to jump in here, Jess, with um, a question um, from Yvonne about data, since that's a large part of what we want to uh, be focusing on today and the capacity building that is required for data. Um, but Yvonne was asking Stuart if um, you, how did you collect the data? Was, what was, were there costs involved and did you raise funds in your communities to pay for it? Um, we made use of our uh, local um, experts um, on our Vital Science Advisory Committee, which we have representatives from um, United Way, Bruce Gray, Poverty Task Force, locally, the Four County Labor Market Board, um, 
and, and other professionals who were able to identify local reports. And no, we didn't spend any money. And I really urge you to have a look at the data source document that supports our vital signs report. You can see the, um, the, uh, the breadth of knowledge that's been assembled locally. There are some major reports that have been completed over the last couple of years, which were, which were fodder for what we, what we present in our report. But the, the cost was um, minimal for that, for that reason of uh, people being so generous and sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sharon posed a question. I read a recent article about municipalities allowing backyard small houses, and she said, I don't believe Collingwood allows this. Is this seen as something that can really help the situation comment? And then others have gone on to comment that this is indeed, you know, coming to our area. But Mark, when you've been seeing it, I mean, I've seen it newly introduced 2016, 2017 with more infill opportunities and secondary suites. Do you think that is really making a difference? Um, and what what scale of a difference can that approach make? So, I mean, I have personal feelings on that. I, I Increasing housing stock always can contribute to helping. However, if there are no affordability metrics attached to that, it just becomes another expensive rental. And so uh, there is a possibility that municipalities can tie that where permissions for the called ADUs um, may be tied to some kind of an affordability metric, particularly if there's any government funds involved, say forgiveness of, of uh, fees, that type of thing. So they can help. What's very disappointing is that the legislation exists um, and all municipalities in fact are required to develop policies around ADUs, which are actually the ability to have a second secondary unit on a property. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, but none of the municipalities in South Georgian Bay have done that. And I find that very disappointing because it's something that can happen fast. Thank you for that. Um, and we're posing the question, we're posing it in the chat, and, and I think it's a great question, Ross, for our speakers as well. Um, with all the work that we, you're seeing and all of the data and the reports, and you both had really great slides that celebrate what we are seeing and what you think would be uh, great next steps. If we were to be 10x bolder uh, in our community and implementing an affordability for all approach, what would we be doing? So could every single person, I think we're still uh, over 50 strong, put in your thought on that question. If we were 10 times bolder in our community in implementing an affordability for all approach to housing, what would we be doing? Please, you're on everybody. Like Jason's answer, providing municipal land for development at no cost for these projects. Um, we've got more joining us, which is great. Um, ask for an affordable committee, housing committee, and volunteer. Um, create a nonprofit housing corp to raise funds, find land, and get building. Um, I agree. I think seeing, I was very excited to hear today that there is movement on the single family zoning. Um, I know that's that's been a blockage that my you know demographic is seeing and, and hoping to see change. Enforcing the social license to invest in workforce housing. Engage those with lived experience as active participants in the planning and action teams. And as Stuart mentioned, like we don't have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. Look outside of our community and see how it's being done. Um, 
do, 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 building smaller, integrating affordable housing in every new development and intensification, ensuring <clears throat> zoning bylaws support housing, zoning land to create mixed housing. So these are phenomenal ideas. And, and I think one of the call to actions as well is going into the summer, we are gonna have a bit of a break between today and our next meeting in September, what can we each be doing, um, you know, over the next two months to try and, and move the needle here. Um, but this is all great. And we're going to, you know, save this chat and, and Roz, I know you, um, you know, kind of Institute collects all of this and actually tries to uh, present it to the right people who need to see, to see these ideas. Um, all right. Yeah, there's a few more here. Um, you know, is, is every municipality engaged in this work looking at social finance strategies? Um, so there's a whole, um, whole list of possibilities with social finance strategies that you can learn more about on our website. Um, our, we have a group working on that and we're happy to share more about it with any municipality, any municipal councillor who is on this call. Uh, we're certainly happy to do that. Jill Ambach, parallel programming. We also need to ensure current housing stock remains safe and affordable. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Develop a housing fund with a percentage of annual property taxes going to the fund, plus encouraging philanthropic contributions using the funds to develop affordable housing. Using modular technology. I mean, that's going on in a lot of places around the world that we haven't really seen yet a lot of here. I'd love to explore the notion of restricted housing as in Whistler um, and incent owners of small homes to participate somehow to avoid small affordable houses being transformed into McMansions. Vote for people with the courage to take on the planners and developers. You know, I often hear people talking about holding um, municipal councillors feet to the fire. And I say there, you know, let's not hold anybody's feet to the fire. We're going to have to figure out how to work together um, and how each of us can do something significant to make a difference here. Um, but for sure, uh, we need to vote for people with courage. There's no question um, about that. Um, there's so many more ideas in the chat and we've only got a few minutes to wrap up and respect everyone's time. Uh, we are so grateful that you all participated in this. Uh, we're going to um, save this chat and we're gonna report on it in our upcoming newsletters. If you are not already subscribed to our newsletter, please do at www.tisgb.com. And that way we can stay in touch with each other. We can stay apprised of the, uh, the new actions that are happening because there are gonna be a lot of them uh, over the next few months with uh, all of this momentum building. Um, so please, um, please uh, certainly subscribe to our newsletter. Please tell us what you thought about today's event. Uh, there's a uh, contact us section on our homepage. Um, Marg and Stuart, thank you so much for all the work that you do in this particular area. Uh, the work is, uh, is not yet done, so I'm sure that we'll be gathering um, regularly to uh, continue to move the needle on this. Um, all of you on the call, uh, you are invited uh, to the public event happening on June 30th, being led by Colin Wood. It's an affordable housing workshop and you can go to Collingwood's website and find out how you can register. It will be a Zoom, um, uh, uh, no, it will be a webinar, <laughs> webinar um, meeting, um, but your voices are important. And again, we're all on a learning journey. So we've got to, um, we've got to carve out the time to learn and to uh, talk with each other about what we can do here. Um, we're going to be sharing um, all of uh, your uh, future good ideas with our design teams. So whatever we hear from you, we, we put together design teams for our series. We're going to start up again in September and have four very important events this fall. So please do consider 
going to not only our homepage and subscribing to the newsletter, but also our join us page, because that is how we are able to keep all of our programming free. We really want everyone to be able to access the knowledge that's at the table today and from all of the other jurisdictions that we're involved with. Um, we will continue to be working on the National Housing Lab, which is being supported by uh, Social Innovation Canada and Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation throughout the summer. Uh, we will be proposing speakers uh, that are working on very innovative ideas for Collingwood uh, World Summit number three, happening uh, October 31st and November 1st. Again, a public event, so please put that in your calendars as well. And um, I would like to thank all of our uh, partners from last year. Um, and in particular, those who have already signed up to be partners with us this year, Greenland Consulting Engineers, Town of the Blue Mountains, Living Water Resort, and we assume many, many others in order to be able to work together to, um, to make progress on this. Thank you, Jessica Flynn, for being a wonderful uh, co-host. Um, and I think uh, that is it. We will see you uh, soon through the newsletter and certainly, um, hopefully, at one of these workshops uh, and in the fall at our events. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>